Hi, welcome to this SAP Tech Byte video series, a deep dive into edge integration cell. This is video part three, and the topic for today is setting up an internal load balancer for the edge integration cell runtime. You will recall that in the first part of our video, we exposed a public IP or an external IP for the virtual host of our APIs and integration flows. While this is a good starting point, in most cases, you will end up exposing a private IP because, hey, that's what probably brought you to the integration cell in the first place, right? So in this video, I will demonstrate one of the many possible ways in which you could expose a private IP in the AKS or Azure ecosystem. You could do something very similar in the AWS space as well. The concepts pretty much remain the same. So let's get started. Just so that we are all starting on the same page, let's do a quick recap of the steps involved in the name resolution of a public IP as demonstrated in video part one. First up, we had the edge integration cell pods and services running in the customer's designated VPC or VNAT. We had a CSI wildcard certificate for my company name.com and the CA verifies that I have indeed ownership of my company name.com before signing the certificate for me, which was then made available as a key pair within the key store of the edge integration cell in integration suite. The integration suite then configures the Istio ingress gateway with the virtual host and the certificates. And finally, when clients do invoke the EIC virtual host, the DNS controller resolves the host to the public IP based on the default configured name server. Of course, it is also possible to configure your own custom name servers here. That would be totally up to you. As an example, you see that for my registered domain, I'm using the default Google name servers. But what I could have also done, for example, here in Azure, is create what is called as a public DNS zone with the same domain, copy the name servers exposed by Azure, and have my domain controller use these name servers for the resolution of the IP. But that's not the focus of today's video. Here is what we will demonstrate today. Instead of a public IP, we have edge integration cell provision a private IP for us. We will not change anything on the key store side. We will stand up what is called as a private DNS zone in Azure for our domain. The private DNS zone has a virtual network link with the VNet where the EIC subnet exists. That way, any client that has network connectivity to the private DNS zone can essentially talk to the private IP of the load balancer. Now, I have intentionally kept this part a bit fuzzy by calling this out as network connectivity. In reality, this is best left for your IT teams to have an opinion on. There are multiple network choices here to be made. For example, Azure Express Route, AWS Direct Connects, or things like VPC peering, site to site or point to site VPNs, DNS private resolvers, etc. Demonstrating that would be outside the scope of what I have to offer. Let's start in the operate menu of the integration suite UI by verifying that the load balancer has an IP assigned from the public range. Let's head to the Edge Lifecycle Management page and modify the properties for the Istio solution. Let's make a selection to switch to an internal load balancer 
and modify. This will take a couple of minutes to reconfigure. Once the update is done, let's go back to the operate menu and refresh. And sure enough, you should see a 10.x IP range indicating that this indeed is a private IP. Next, let's head over to our Azure cockpit and like I did mention in the beginning, create a private DNS zone. Select the resource group and more importantly, I'll give this the same name as my desired virtual host and create. Once the deployment is done, let's head to the virtual network link setting and add a new link. Here the virtual network that this links to is basically the virtual network of my Kubernetes runtime. In case you are wondering how to get this, simply head over to your Kubernetes cluster, look up the property settings, and this links to the resource group that contains all the infrastructure components of your cluster. Here you should be able to locate the virtual network resource. And sure enough, you will be able to verify that this does contain the subnet of the AKS ports and services. At this point, also make a note that there are other subnets I've created here to host my persistency services like Postgres and Redis. We will discuss the connectivity options for these in the next video part. Let's head back to the DNS zone creation step and confirm our settings. I will make it a point not to select auto registration, which would then enable all IPs in the VNet via this link not something that we want yet. Let's wait for the link to be created. And once it's done, let's head back to the overview section. Here, let's add a new record set. Get the name from the virtual host subdomain and get the internal IP from the external IP section. Set a reasonable time to live and create the record set. Once the record set is created, congratulations, we are almost done here. But the question is, how do we test? There are multiple ways here. My simple approach would be to create a jump server right within the Kubernetes cluster. As you can see here, there are multiple edge namespaces. Please do not disturb any of the system created ones. Here in this case, I'll just use the default unused namespace. Let me bring up a transient Docker instance of an Ubuntu VM using the kubectl run command and start a bash console. Let's update the package manager, upgrade the default packages. Once this is done, I'm going to install two additional utility software packages, one for curl and one for DNS utils. Once this is done, let me do an NS lookup of the virtual host and our jump server is able to resolve the virtual host into a private IP of our load balancer. Also, do note that if I bring up a command line from my local machine or anywhere else in the internet and try to do an NS lookup, there is obviously no resolution because the private IP cannot be discovered 
from outside the network. Let's copy the URL of our test iFlow from the monitor tab. Next, I'm going to copy the client ID secret and access UAA's OAuth token URL of the service instance from the BTP cockpit. Put these in my Postman client and generate an access token. Copy the access token and construct a curl command and execute. And as expected, uh, HTTP status 200 is returned. As a final check, let's head back to the monitoring tab on the UI. Look for signs of activity and sure enough, I see a successful message being reported. So to summarize, in this video, we saw one of the many possible ways in which you could manage an internal IP resource in a hyperscaler environment. But do keep in mind that in your company, the network and security rules could be totally different. And for example, there are multiple and different firewall rules for you to consider. With that said, let's head over to the next video that deals with mounting external persistency for the edge integration cell runtime. See you on the other side.